Hi class. This is Dr. Nerds. These are your makeup lectures for um, my uh, conference that I have to go to. And a little bit of a boost toward the weekend too. And I'll probably do something over the break. Because I'm a little worried. People are, you guys have to move along on these um, reactions a little bit. They're in chapter 5. Okay. I don't know if you can see that. Is that good? Mm -hmm. Okay. So the reaction I was doing in class last time was hydroboration. So I'm just going to go over this briefly again. If we have this, can you see the red? Mm -hmm. If you have something like this and it's unsymmetrical, let's say like that. Okay. What we said was if you were doing a reaction with diborane, E2H6, followed by hydrogen peroxide, and, and base. The way the reaction works is that this reagent behaves as BH3. And we talked in class a lot about the fact that the boron is the delta plus and the hydrogen is the delta minus. And I said that's called umpalong, which is reversal of polarity. So the way it reacts, it's a concerted mechanism. So the way it reacts is that the hydrogen is the nucleophile and the boron, we'll just draw this out in 3D, is the electrophile and it's concerted. And what this means is that everything happens at once, but the way you should think of it is that this is the delta minus, this is the delta plus. So the electrophile goes to the less substituted carbon and the nucleophile goes to the more substituted carbon. So if I'm drawing the arrows, they might be like this. This can also happen from the bottom face. Okay, it can also happen on the bottom face, in which case you would get these two intermediates. Now notice it's coming in. This is a concerted sin addition. That means the groups are coming in from the top face only. You'd get this, and you would get its mirror image. Okay, so I'm trying to save a little space there. The mirror image would just come in from going in from the bottom. Now, this boron actually has the capacity to react two more times. So it reacts two more times, and you end up with an intermediate that's like this. And you can think about where I got this from. This would be hooked to the CH2, which is hooked to the carbon with the other groups on it. I'm, not, I'm probably not retaining the stereochemistry there. I don't usually have students write it this way, okay, et cetera. I don't know if the stereochemistry is perfect there. But the point is, this can add two more times to two more molecules. So the stoichiometry is actually three of these to one BH3, okay? So it takes three molecules, three molecules per BH3. Okay, we could work out the stoichiometry on the B2H6. So this, again, if I write this out, and this is probably be the only time I ever write it. If anyone wants me to explain it, I'll explain it. But it actually reacts three times, and part of the reason it's thought that it goes this way is in addition to this being the electrophile, this side is also more sterically hindered. Okay, so when it adds, you get this kind of intermediate and its mirror image. Okay, it's really in that kind of format. Okay, and then in the second step, when you add H2O2, OH, the boron is replaced with an OH. So what you end up with is this. You would end up with this. and this. Now notice again, the advantage of this reaction is that you get the anti-Markovnikov alcohol 
but the addition is really Markovnikov because this is the electrophile. The electrophile is adding to the less su substituted side, but notice we get the primary alcohol. Okay, so that's hydroboration. That's what you need to know about hydroboration. I'm not going to ask you this mechanism. Okay, next. So reaction seven. Reaction seven. Reaction seven is catalytic hydrogenation. If I were going to write about this generally, what it entails is taking some kind of double bonded compound, adding hydrogen gas in the presence of a catalyst such as palladium on carbon, that's a type of catalyst, a metal catalyst, or you can use certain types of nickel catalysts and you can use platinum catalysts, there's all kinds, there's rhodium catalysts, all kinds of catalysts. And in this reaction what happens is, it's kind of straightforward, the um, hydrogens add across the double bond, it's usually Sin addition. Okay, usually sin addition. That means same face. So this goes in the category with hydroboration in terms of stereochemistry. It's not always. Okay, mechanistically, um, what kind of solvent would you use for this? You'd usually use something like ethanol. Mechanistically, what's happening? It's very complicated mechanistically. I actually have a little movie on the web that I might send you. But basically, when you do the reaction, you do it in some kind of a high pressure chamber sort of like a, you know, a, a, a thick-walled um, flask, very thick-walled. And then what you would put in this flask is you would put your alkene, whatever alkene you're trying to react, let's say it's like that, and you would add H2, you would add, um, you'd put the catalyst in there, and the catalyst would be sitting on the, the bottom. You know, your palladium would be down there deposited on carbon, which is just like charcoal. Uh, so you'd see this black solid on the bottom. Your alkene would dissolve, and it would be in some kind of inert to this reaction, solvent like ethanol. So that's the solvent. And then what you do is you'd have this hooked up to a tank of helium. Okay? So the helium is pushing in, and there's helium pressure on the top of this liquid. And there's, I didn't say that right. It's supposed to be hydrogen. Hy helium won't do a thing. All right, hydrogen. Helium will make the bottle fly up. <laughs> Just joking. Um, it'll be hydrogen gas, and the hydrogen gas will, will partially dissolve in the ethanol, and it actually reacts with this alkene in the ethanol, and you have to kind of shake it while it's going. These reactions are a little dangerous because they're under high pressure. Um, so this is obviously a way to make alkenes from alkenes. Um, one of the uh, most... So, so giving you an idea about this in terms of the mechanism again, like say this is a particle of palladium deposited on carbon. What happens in the reaction is that the alkene in question, let's say that's it, interacts with the palladium and the hydrogen actually bonds onto the palladium like that. And then one by one, the hydrogens are delivered like this is, if this is my palladium particle, one by one, the hydrogens are delivered, the other one's still hanging on there, to the, um, this is the palladium, to the, al what was the alkene. Okay, so, um, and then this is freed with the two hydrogens on it. This is, again, something where you're not going to be asked to write a mechanism at all. But, so what happens is, the double bond interacts with the palladium. The hydrogen interacts with the palladium, actually bonds to it. The hydrogens are delivered one by one to the carbons that were in the double bond, and then it's a free, saturated, think about that, saturated alkane. Okay, and this fits the, the definition of real catalysis, right, because it creates a surface for the reaction to take place. It facilitates the bond formation by lowering, and it lowers the um, activation barrier of the reaction. And then the palladium is recycled, so you can use it over again. Um, okay, now where this has a sort of a biological application is that, um, you know, if you have a fat, what time is it? 
and this one. It's almost 10 minutes. Okay. If you have a fat, like, uh, from, from a natural source, it might look like this. You know, it's, they're, they're, what they are are esters. They're triesters of glycerol. And just to give you a little idea about this, I'll just show you an unsaturated fat. Okay, and these should all have the even numbers. So 1, 2, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. That's myristic acid. 2, 4, 6, 8, 12. That's also myristic acid. This is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So that would be decanoic acid. Okay. Or decanoate. Okay, so fats are either mono dye or triesters of glycerol, and glycerol is this structure, and these are, this is a biomolecule, okay, so um, a triester, so there's, see there's an ester here, an ester here, and an ester here, now, what I'm demonstrating, so it's a mono, it could have one chain, dye, it could have two chains, or it could have three chains, and the chains can be different, now, a fat becomes an oil when it has multiple unsaturated chains, or at least a certain number of unsaturated chains or unsaturated points. So this is an example of a saturated chain, saturated chain, and this is an unsaturated chain. You'll notice a couple things. First of all, in nature, um, these chains, which are derived from acids, carboxylic acids, have even numbers, and also they have, when they have double bonds, they are cis double bonds, okay? So you might think a little bit about this because, um, again, when a fat, which is a solid material, becomes an oil, which is a liquid material, it has multiple polyunsaturation points, or at least enough of them to make it a liquid. So you read about that a little bit in your lab book, and what it said is that when you have these kind of chains, when they're in the solid state, these kind of chains pack really nicely on top of each other. They have really nice regular interactions, and they have very they fit together very nicely, almost like pieces of a puzzle. Okay, but if you read in your um, lab book a little bit, these kind of bonds have a 120 degree angle. So the way I've drawn this is not correct because what happens is the angle kind of opens up. I didn't do it well there either, but the angle kind of opens up like this as it's going along. And what it does is it creates kinks in the chain. So the chain doesn't lay out nice and flat. So you've probably read about this, um, or if you've ever read the side of a box of cookies or cakes, it's getting, it's getting better as time goes on. But, for example, if you read, read the side of a Tasty Cake box, for example, not to pick on Tasty Cake, but um, it'll say, a lot of these things will say, and they used to always say this, they would say partially hydrogenated um, say, like, um, olive oil, or partially hydrogenated, they don't use that in baking, partially hydrogenated, um, what's the kind of oil we use all the time now? Canola. Canola, thank you. Partially hydrogenated canola oil, something like that. And, you know, you look at that and you say canola oil, right? And people think of canola oil as being highly unsaturated, but then it says it's partially hydrogenated. So what does that mean? What that means is they took something like this, perhaps, this is not, you know, canola oil has a number of different chains in it. But they took it and they partially hydrogenated it. So what that means is they added H2, palladium, and they shook it up with the catalyst, but they partially hydrogenated. And unfortunately, what happens when chains are partially hydrogenated, like say this is partially hydrogenated, it had 10, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. What happens sometimes is some of the double bonds disappear and then some of the double bonds were isomerized into trans double bonds. So when you're reading all this stuff about trans fats, you know, when a baked good says on the side how much trans fat it has, it's referring to the fact that some kind of oil, something that was normally oil, was partially hydrogenated. And I am assuming this is done to change the texture of it because everyone knows that fat has a better texture than oil when you're cooking. And... Um, what happens in the process, so they partially hydrogenate it in the hope, I guess, of retaining some of those double bonds, 
But in the process, sometimes the cis double bonds become trans double bonds. And I want you to think about how something with trans double bonds would pack into the solid state. So this, like these chains, these trans double bonds pack really nicely into the solid state, which means they're going to have higher melting points, which means they're more likely to be solid, right? And of course, the reason it is healthier to eat unsaturated fat than saturated fat is saturated fats solidify more easily at body temperature and form plaques in your arteries, and unsaturated fats don't, okay? So I hope that made some sense, but some of that's in your lab book. But again, partial, if you read on the side of a box, it says partial hydrogenation. It means this reaction has been done, but not completely, so only some of the double bonds have been hydrogenated. Okay, now this reaction, hydrogenation, is a memorization reaction. You have to memorize it. Um, again, I'm not going to ask you a mechanism for this. I usually don't cover hydrogenation in class anymore because there isn't enough time, and I expect students to learn it. And sometimes when I do things on video, people don't learn it. So slow the video down, go over it, read it in the textbook, chapter, um, chapter 5. People should be reading chapter 5. Make a date with Dr. Professor Loudon and start reading your book. It's a good book. Okay, chapter, reaction 8. Okay. Reaction 8 is um, oxidation of alkenes with KMnO4 aqueous, is this readable, mm -hmm. or osmium tetroxide. And people still use osmium tetroxide all the time to do this reaction. It's more toxic, okay? And then this would be followed up with, this is followed up with sodium bisulfite in water. And that's kind of a reductive, that would be called a reductive workup. Again, these are memorization reactions. Reaction five, six, seven, and eight, you have to memorize them. I've given you, I'll give you parts of these and kind of show you how they work, but you have to memorize them. Okay, so oxidation of alkenes, Okay, um, the way this works is if you have an alkene, you add KMnO4. KMnO4 is purple. It's a beautiful purple colored compound. Um, you follow that up, or that's usually done in water. It might be slightly basic. And the outcome is you will get OH groups that are syn to each other. On the um, on where the double bond was. Okay, similarly, if I have this and I add osmium tetroxide and follow that up with two, this means it's a separate step NaHSO3, oops, and water. Okay, you would also get the same product. They basically do the same thing. I'm going to show you a little bit of how this works, okay, but. Generally speaking, you have to learn these. So if you have a double bond and you see either of these oxidizing agents, um, water, first step, and the first, the first one, water, purple, the byproduct for this is manganese dioxide. Um, you, you, we have to do a lot of stuff with oxidation. That's coming up really soon, maybe the week after next. But you might start one of thinking, thinking about oxidation a little bit. KMnO4. This has, these have an oxidation state, right, a standard oxidation state of minus 2. So the overall oxidation state is minus 8. The K is plus 1, so therefore this manganese is plus 7 oxidation state. And this is a redox reaction. A lot of organic reactions are. We're going to cover that more formally the last week, okay? But this is minus 4, plus 4. So you remember you learned in redox, Right, one species is oxidized, one is reduced. You can see, see here with the metal, which you're more used to dealing with, that the manganese is being reduced from a plus 7 oxidation state to a plus 4. What's happening here are the carbons are being oxidized. The way you can tell this very readily is the carbons are gaining oxygen. Okay, The carbons are gaining oxygen. That tells you they're being oxidized for your first exposure to oxidation. Okay, Now, how are these reactions thought to occur? Again, they are syn- Additions. So if you were working on that means there's stereo specific. Okay. 
So if I was working on a ring, for example, say I had this ring, this five-membered ring, and it had a double bond and maybe a methyl group, and I added osmium tetroxide followed by sodium bisulfite in water, you would get two products. The two OH groups would be delivered from the same phase, like that, and you plus you get the delivery from the other phase, so that the OH, can you see that, that's so ridiculously small, mm -hmm. so that the OH groups are back, like that. So these groups are coming in from the front and from the back, okay, so let me show you a little bit of the mechanism. Okay, so if again, if I had this ring system, I'll draw it up bigger. If I were working with um, potassium permanganate, for example, MN, and they have similar mechanisms. If you look in your textbook, you will see a very similar mechanism for this, okay? But with osmium, I think Loudon only shows osmium. This is kind of a little safer to work with for an undergraduate. So this is purple. This is the mechanism. Okay, this is purple, and what happens is this, these oxygens in a concerted step, that means there's no real beginning or end to this, all these bonds form and break. So this grabs this, this grabs the oxygen, and the manganese, um, the manganese takes the oxygens in and, and is reduced, and there's more steps in this, okay? But the thing is, in syn additions, both atoms have to be delivered from the same phase. So if these are coming in from the top phase, for example... It's happening out here. This hydrogen is going to get pushed to the back. The methyl is going to get pushed to the back. But it can also happen from the back phase. So the two outcomes, the two intermediates, would look like this. The H would be back. The O, M, N. You are not going to be asked to write this mechanism. I doubt you will ever be asked to write it. Okay? But that's the intermediate. And then the other intermediate would look like this. With the hydrogen out and, see the methyl was back there, I, le I left it off, and the methyl out. So the methyl gets pushed to the back, methyl gets pushed to the front, and then in the second step with the water, just being in the presence of water, this, you know, it's sort of like a hydrolysis, but not exactly. So the manganese gets replaced with an, an H. So you get this plus its MI. Okay, um, so those reactions are good for putting two OH groups in. Um, there's one more reaction, actually two more reactions in this chapter. Ozonolysis I may hold off on for a bit, but I need to do um, something that's called uh, free radical HBR addition. What time is it? 23 and a half. Okay, so I'm going to take a brief interlude here. And I'm going to tell you one more thing, then I'm going to start a new movie. So these are going to be in three installments, okay? So this is your first installment. This is um, movie or, or lecture number one from the day I missed, which is it's going to be November the 21st, right? November right, the 21st right, is right, tomorrow. Right. So this is, a, I'm just going to do a little what I've, I'll call a synthetic interlude here. So synthetic interlude. All right, I want to like emphasize the point that we have gone over a few reactions that are sort of related to each other in terms of synthesis. Okay, so for example, supposing I have this as my starting material. Okay, and I want to make this. I need to make this for some reason. Perhaps this is a, an important intermediate in some synthesis. Okay, how would I do that? All right, so there are, there are several options. So you could use H3O plus and some heat, okay? That's all well and good. However, there's a problem with that. And the problem is, if you did H3O plus and heat, the, 
the pie bond would reach out and grab the H, kick out the water, okay, and you would get this carbocation. Just as we've learned, this is kind of our basic stuff we've learned, but although some of the water would attack here and you would get some of that, you'd also get a rearrangement of the cation to form, in all likelihood, a tertiary cation, in which case the water would attack this, and that would ultimately end up being this alcohol. So the problem with using hydronium ion on a double bond to make that compound is that you're going to get byproducts, and it's something you should think about. Rearrangement is a really big problem. Why do you get rearrangement? Because the first species that adds is a proton, and a proton cannot protect a carbocation the way a halogen can. Okay, so what, how else could you do this? You have to start thinking about your reactions like what you use them for, okay? So how could I go from here? So last week I told you, and this was one of the hardest lectures, it was on Friday, I was going over these more complicated reactions that involve metals. So as I told you, scientists, chemists invented a reaction that gets around this problem of rearrangement by using mercuric acetate, and this is just one version of this reaction, And people keep asking me about the organization of these reactions. I've been going through these reactions. I called them reaction one, reaction two, reaction three, reaction four, reaction five, and so forth. They're in your notes in that order. And a couple times I stopped and summarized. So you really have to sit and go through your notes. You do have the organization there. So you have mercuric acetate, and then that follows up by adding sodium borohydride and base. Okay? Now, if we use these reagents... Because the mercury, I'm, I'm out of room here, but because the mercury forms a mercuronium ion on this double bond, right, it forms a mercuronium ion, you've got to go back, and people keep saying to me, how do you know how the reaction occurs? Because you, you know something about the mechanism. That's how people remember these things. But you make a mercuronium ion. Because you make a mercuronium ion, with the water that's in this step, there's also water in this step, the water in the step is going to attack, open up the mercuronium ion, and it's not going to rearrange because the mercury protects the carbocation. Okay, so that would be a perfectly legit way to make what you would call the Markovnikov alcohol. So this is the Markovnikov alcohol without rearrangement. And then to review a little more of what I did today, just did today, um, you know, if I took the same substrate, and I know in one of the classes I did this, but I want to repeat it. It's, it bears repeating. If I took the same su substrate and I wanted to put the OH group in the other position, what I would have to do is, to, is use a different reagent. Because again, if I use H3O+, plus, the proton's going here, the charge is going here and here. So I'm going to get two alcohols. If I use oxymercuration reduction, the one I just showed you, the H is going here and the OH is going here. So what if I want to switch it around? What if I want to put the OH where the H would normally be? This is where you'd use umpalum, right? You'd use reversal of polarity. You'd use H.C. Brown's famous boron reaction, one of his famous reactions, where you would take B2H6 and then follow that up with oxidative conditions. Now, why are these oxidative conditions? Because there's a lot of oxygen. The way students remember this is they know this adds the hydrogen and this adds the OH, even though it's kind of a complicated reaction. If I did this, oh, I have it drawn here already, but if I did this, the, the boron is the electrophile. The boron would go here, and then it would be replaced with the OH, okay? Now, another thing, just to show you something else I just did, like supposing I wanted to make, supposing I have this and I want to go to this, okay? What would I have to add? I need to add two hydrogens. If I want to add hydrogens, I do catalytic hydrogenation. Okay? Sometimes when, you know, when you say, what do I need to make? You say, what do I need to add, right? What if I wanted to make this? I'm putting the reagents in too soon. Supposing I want to make this, 
How would I do that? I would add OS 04 to NAH SO3. I will repeat. You probably have to repeat some of these reactions five, ten times before you're going to get them. It's not going to just like by osmosis go into your brain or even just watching me do it, you won't get it. You've got to sit with pad and paper, marker board, whatever, and write things over and over. Okay, so that's the end of our first lecture, first makeup lecture, um, November 21st, 2011.